Amen. Praise the Lord. He is worthy. Amen. Well, amen. Well, little Johnny's dad was a pastor and little Johnny wasn't but five years old, but he had already wanted to be like his dad. And sure enough, one day, Johnny's mom was there with him, watching him, and there was little Johnny in the living room with the cat in front of him, and little Johnny had one of his kid books, holding it like his dad holds it in the pulpit, and there preaching to that little cat, just training to be a preacher like his dad. Well, little five-year-old Johnny went on off to play, and his mom went in the kitchen, and then suddenly the mom hears a loud, thunderous cry that sounded like it was coming from the cat. And there was just blood-curling screams coming from that bathroom. So Mama opened the door, and there was Johnny in the tub with the cat. And that cat just screaming and hollering and clawing to get out of that water. And the mom said, Johnny, what on earth are you doing with that cat? Said, I'm baptizing him. <laughs> and said, Johnny, you don't understand. Cats are deathly afraid of water. To which Johnny replied to Mom, well, he should have thought about that before he joined my church. <laughs> well, there's some things we need to think about this morning before Jesus comes back that are a little bit more important than Johnny's little episode, but there are some things we need to think about. Seriously, this morning, as we look at a passage of Scripture that I believe tells us better than anything about what to do until he comes back. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went to tell them a parable. Zacchaeus had just got saved. Because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Well, they thought Jesus was going to set up camp right then and there and set up his kingdom, but that wasn't going to be so because Jesus was going to explain why that wasn't. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. So he sets up this parable. This is about a nobleman, that's himself, setting up a kingdom and then coming back. Pretty clear cut, isn't it? About what is going to happen in this parable. So this morning, the title of the message is What to Expect, What Jesus Expects When He Returns. And don't think He's not going to expect something. Oh, He's just going to give me a hug. He very well may. But He's going to expect something. You know, life's full of expectations. I mean, our job has expectations for us. Our marriages have expectations for us. Our schools have expectations for us. Would it make sense that Jesus is going to have some expectations of us? We just feel like, well, okay, sirrah, sirrah, just so we're saved. But that's not the case. He makes it clear. And just for those that are maybe clicking around to say, well, isn't this mainly talking about the second coming? Yes. But this applies to the second coming, rapture, as far as practicality, or your and I's death. And may I add, whichever one comes first is what Jesus is going to expect. So if you die, you go up in the rapture, it's the second coming, Jesus is going to expect it that very moment. Whichever those would come first in either of our life, we need to know that Jesus is coming back according to this parable, expecting something real specific. So what is it? Well, it's our responsibility to make sure we know what it is. You know, you have employees that Employee leaders say, you know, employees would do a better job if they just knew what was expected of them. A lot of employees are frustrated because they're going, my boss doesn't make his expectations clear. You know, if he'd just tell me, it seemed like he's always changing his expectations. You know, a lot of employees would be a lot happier if they just know what was expected of them. I expect you to do this, this, and this, and if you do that, we're okay. Well, Jesus, same way. He makes his expectations clear so that when, when he comes back, there won't be any doubt. So let's look at them. First one, he expects us to be obedient and serving. That's what he's going to expect. Why? Because the people he calls to himself to tell him what to do are called slaves. And he called 10 of his slaves. King James says servants. Same principle. Servants are slaves. They work for him. They were his employees. Matter of fact, when we, matter of fact, we maybe ought to start using a different terminology. It's okay to use the terminology saved, but maybe we ought to start using the, the terminology slaved. 
Instead of like, this is when I got saved, we ought to say, this is when I got slaved. I don't think you get that. Because that's what it says here. These are representatives of his kingdom people because we are his servants. We are his slaves. We're no longer slave to sin. We're slave to Jesus, which is a good slavery because it's really the only true freedom you'll ever experience. You'll never experience freedom unless you become a slave to Jesus. And these are his slaves or his servants. You know, it's said that the greatest measure of a man is not the number of servants he has, but the number of people he serves. See, our goal is maybe to get so rich we'll have a lot of servants. But our goal should be how many people are we going to serve? I'm going to try to outdo and serve more people and not have more servants. And Jesus makes it clear. Matter of fact, there's a dichotomy of a different group of people that he talks about in 14 called the citizens of the country. You know what their view was? We don't want this man to reign over us. We don't want him to rule over us. That sentence right there is why people are lost because they don't want Jesus to rule over their life. I know what the Bible says, but. I know what he says, but. I know what God wants, but. Well, you just don't want him to reign over you. You don't want him to rule over. And so that's really the definition of really somebody that doesn't want to know Christ as their Savior. They don't want anybody to rule and reign over them, especially somebody with these kind of standards. Same way back then. These people said, hey, we're not even, we don't even want this nobleman to rule over us at all. So there's your dichotomy, slaves, and people that don't. In other words, a lot of people don't mind serving God as long as they're serving him as a consultant. Listen, Jesus don't need any input on how to do it. He already knows how to do it. He just needs people to do it. And we serve as slaves, not consultants. And so he makes that evident here first. Then he goes on to make another expectation. He expects us to know what we've been given. And he gave them, all 10 of them, minus, and he said to them. In other words, each one got a mina. He gave them something. We are given something. You say, well, what were he given? Well, first of all, this mina is money. And the amount of money he gives each one of them is about a three-month wage. So if you went into your employer tomorrow, Monday, and your employer says, look, I'm gonna, I've calculated what three months wages are for you and I'm gonna give you all that money lump sum. That's what these guys got. As employees, they got a lump sum payment to them of a three month wage. So take your salary, divide it by four and that's what you'd have been given. Lump sum. Money, that's what it is. And what does this money represent? Well, I believe it represents all that we've been given to reach our life's potential for God's kingdom. That is our time, our talent, our treasures, including our influence and all the spiritual resources that we've been given as Christians. We've been loaded up, boatload, truckload of them with the blessings of God. We've given given time. Well, I don't have much time. You got as much as anybody else, 24 hours. Well, I hadn't been given uh, many talents. You got what you got. Well, I hadn't been given much treasure, but you got what you got. And the only reason you have that and I have that is because God's given it to me. We only have time, talent, and treasures because God gave it. And remember, each person got the same amount. Yeah, but Brother Tim, some people have more talent than I. Yes, but you've got what you've got. Some people have more treasure than me. I know, but you've got what you've got. He gave that to you. He gave you your time. He gave you your talent. He gave you your treasures. He gave you your influence. And he gave you all those spiritual blessings and promises that are in the Bible. He loaded us up with those. Those are the minus for our life's potential for his kingdom. Will we measure up to our life's potential for his kingdom? He's given us a potential. I don't know what it is for you. We have to determine what that is for me, but we all have a potential to do something in our life for Christ. And you say, well, I wish I had something to do that with. You already do. If you're a Christian, you've been given that already. You got your manna. Everything that we need in this parable, we have. 
Because we'll find at the end, there's no excuses. Why? Because we've already been given what we need to serve his kingdom in our life's work, whatever that is. The third one is he expects us to do something with what we've been given. Not only have and see what we've been given, but to do something with it. Verse 14, do business with this, that is the mina, until I come back. Verse 15, when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that, there's a reason he's gonna call them, he might know what business they had done. All right, so you're seeing the parable fall into play. When Jesus comes back, don't say this. I wonder what he's going to do. I wonder what he's going to ask. I wonder what he's going to say. Don't say that to Jesus because this morning you know what he's going to say. What business did you do with what I gave you? It won't be a if, it'll be a for sure. Now this word do business has to do with a continually doing business, a kind of an investing, a trading capacity. So what he was saying was, look, you take this money, I'm giving you three months worth. You don't have to do anything to earn it, I'm giving it to you. Salvation was free, everything we have was free, he's giving it to us. And he's saying, now here's what I want you to do, go do business. Now he doesn't tell them exactly what kind of business. He's not micromanaging. He didn't tell them, okay, I want y'all to go buy three acres of farmland and uh, sell this and, and, and invent this. He, he didn't go into all that micromanaging. He just says, he gives it almost to the guys their choice. What you feel led to do with this, but invest it and make some money on it. So maybe some guy thought, well, okay, I, you know, here's this money and looks like it, Jerusalem's booming pretty good and Looks like the Jerusalem Grand Parkway is gonna come right through this area right here and that looks like a good investment to buy land near this Jerusalem Parkway and so I'm gonna buy a little land right there. That's probably gonna uh, go up in money and I've got three months wage, I'm going to buy that and boom, it booms and you take that profit and that money and boy, you take it and you say, man, chariot wheels are really hot right now. A lot of people need chariot wheels and boy, that's the upcoming thing. I'm gonna invest in chariot wheels and boom, boy, you make all that money and boy, you take that money and say, man, I'm gonna invest it in here and boy, that business takes off. You take all that money and boy, you invest. That's what it means, just steadily investing, doing business, not just one act, but a continual buying and trading and selling and making your master money. That is what it's all about, making him money, according to this parable, is making him a lot of money. It's his money and he left these slave servants. You say, Brother Tim, I, I don't know if I got what it takes. You got the same time, talent, and treasure. Everybody else may not the same degree, but you have it. You say, I don't know if the Lord has me anything to do. I checked this morning. Kingdom unemployment is zero. Okay? I read it. It's zero. Not one Christian is unemployed in the kingdom work. So we can't say that's a reason. He's got something for all of us to do because he's given something that we've been given. Brother Tim, where am I in the Bible? You may ask. That's a good question. I'm going to show you by pushing this little button. Right there. You and I live in between 14 and 15. And if you want to know where you live in the Bible, say, I live in between verse 14 and 15. That is my life. That is my calling. That is my destiny. That is my potential. 14 and 15. Mark it down. That's where you and I live right there. In between him saying, do business until I come back. And then the very next words were, when he returns. That's where you and I live, in between those two verses. Do something, I'm coming back. That's it, that's life. Fold it up, mark it down in a deal, and put it in your Bible, that's life. Right there for the believer, if you wanna summarize it in two verses. 
Life fits right there for the believer, for me, for you, for all that come to know Christ. And you notice right there it says when he returned. It doesn't say after he sent an email telling everybody he's going to come in a couple of weeks. Uh, after he sent a chariot to say, hey, it's going to be in about a month. The master's coming back. There's absolutely, in between 14 and 15, no warning. Remember the old dreaded, in school, I don't know if they still do them anymore, the old dreaded pop quiz. Now, some of you, some of y'all weren't ready the way you laughed at that one, you know. It's called a pop quiz because the teacher just pops it on it. In case you didn't know that. The old pop quiz. That means the teacher can pop it on you at any time, any day, without any warning. Why does, she, why does he or she do that? To make sure you're ready at any time. Now there's sometimes, she says, and a Thursday will be an exam, and next week Friday will be an exam, but she lets you know any time I can give you a pop quiz. I can pop it on you. Well, he pops this one on. This is a pop return. It's unannounced. Boom, it's there. Woo! Oh man, that, that happened quick. I didn't know about the warning. The warning is this morning. It won't be when he returns unless you just hear the trumpet, but that's a millisecond before he returns. I mean, so you, you don't have time to think about it. It's going to be a pop return. So let's see what happens in the parable. Let's see who will be in this parable. He doesn't mention what all 10 do. He mentions what three of them will do to give us a good roundabout uh, polling of probably what the 10 would do. First guy, master, Remember, they already done their work. Your mina, your just one little mina, has made 10 minas more. For you people in banking, that's a 1,000% return. Anybody get 1,000% on their money today? Just raise your hand up. We're gonna go where you go. So anybody get 1,000? This guy got the master a 1,000% return on his one mina. He got him 10 more. Oh, man. I wonder what he's gonna tell him. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing. You will be in authority over 10 cities. Oh man, he did good. And I don't believe he sat around. The master wasn't there anymore to say, do that. Go do it that way. He was out looking. How can I make money with this? He didn't just sit around. You know, I've heard before the, Bees that make the honey don't hang around the hive. They can get out there and find the nectar and pollen and whatever that is and bring it back, make some honey. And this guy was just going out saying, man, I'm not waiting on anybody to tell me what to do. I'm going to look for myself. Just don't know what to do for Jesus. <laughs> this guy didn't. He didn't say, I don't know what to do for my master. He just said, man, I've been given this. I better look and find out a way to use it because he's going to come back. Ask me what I did with it. And so he got busy. Hey, here's another guy, guy two. Then the second guy came and said, your mina master has made five minas. That wasn't bad neither. That's 500% return. Anybody in here getting a 500% return on their money? Man, that's, this guy did. Don't you know that was a good deal for his master? So he gets 500% return. Well, he gets a praise too. And he said to them, and you're over five cities. This millennial reign is what we believe because this is going to be important. Remember, this is important for us to know not to look over. Now, we got a third guy. And another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. I can just see the expression. I just love to read scripture and see an expression. The guy going, what? <laughs> Did I hear you just say you put it in a handkerchief? I gave you one and you got my one back? <laughs> my goodness. This guy didn't read the directions. He's the guy that puts together stuff without reading the instructions. He must have not been listening because he didn't lose anything 
but he didn't gain anything. And I guess he thought he was all right. Now check before we find out what the consequences of this going to be. Do you notice all three guys at least use the right terminology? It's your mina. It's your mina. It's your mina. I'll do whatever I want with my money because it's my money and I work hard for that money. Let God stop that little heart for a beat or two. You get zero money. Well, it's my time. Let him stop that heart a couple of beats. You don't have any more time. It's my talent only because he gave it to you to make the money or do whatever you want. They all realize, hey, what you gave me is yours. What you gave me is yours. Even that last guy's as dumb as what he did was, at least he realized it wasn't mine. It was, it was the Lord's to do the Lord's work, not our work. All right, now let's look at this guy a little more detail. The third guy we're going to spend the most time on is him. He expects us not to have excuses for not using what we've been given. For not using what we've been given. His excuse. For I was afraid of you because you're an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and you reap what you did not sow. What is he saying? I didn't do anything because I was afraid of you. I knew you were going to expect a lot when you come back. You were going to expect me to do something with it. And I was, a, I was afraid of you because I know you, you're an exacting man. You, you want a great return on your money. I was afraid. Well, duh. If he is that afraid, you ought to have done better than guy number one and two. He hung himself with his own rope. You know what? Excuses are what keep all of us from being all we can be for Christ. We all give them. Some are legitimate, I mean, you know, but most of them are not. Look, I have and you have an excuse for not doing or doing whatever it is that we want to do or not do. Or at least one, two of us in this room can be honest that we all give excuses for not doing or doing. I mean, you can have somebody that's like, you're going to church? No, I got this little tickle right there, right there. If, if I get that tickle in my throat, I better not go up there. Or you're going to that baseball game down there to, wherever they play it, downtown. And uh, yeah, but I'm only running 110 fever. Well, you wouldn't run 110, you'd be dead. But you know, I'm only running 105 fever. Bless God, I'll just put a little ice on my head and I'm going. Yeah. Quit looking at me that way. Because we'll go wherever it is we really want to go. And we'll not go where it is we really don't want to go. And we got this little thing in our pocket called the old excuse. And we can give it, and I'm not saying you can give it, but you're not going to give it here. It ain't going to work on this one. They may work at work. I was uh, down, I was just down in my back. Or I, those excuses will work, but work, but they're not going to work on this one. None of my excuses or your excuses are going to work here. Pastor one time put a sign up on the marquee. He said, if you've got nothing to do, don't do it here. <laughs> you know, he had his excuses, but they didn't really measure up. What were they? I mean, he could have said, well, what if this guy never comes back? I mean, I've done all this work for nothing. And he didn't say when he was coming back. And I've waited and I've waited and I've waited and I've waited and here's all these guys working their fingers to the bone. Who, who's going to say he even comes back? And if he comes back, maybe he'll come back later and I can chill out now and work toward the very end when he does come back and have a vacation now and work right when he gets ready to come back because he'll probably come back a lot later than I thought. Or they'll probably think of this. Will it really make that much difference? If I invest or don't invest, I mean, I'm still one of his slaves. So what does that matter? Or he may end up saying, when he comes back and I only have what I have, the one that he gave me, here, here watch this one. This is the big one that I believe we'll hear on judgment on the day we stand before Jesus is this, he'll understand. That's the big one that Satan gives us. 
Use that one. That's the best one. Oh, Jesus, you'll understand why I didn't do what I needed to do with my potential for life for your church and your kingdom and your people and what I did to reach out my world for Christ. He'll understand. He's not. Why? Because this parable says he's not. Why? Because we're about to see what's going to happen when his excuse gets shot down. The master didn't say, oh, that's okay, I understand. Well, he didn't. He said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Then why did you not put my money in the bank and having come, I would have collected it with interest? First of all, he tells him, you hung yourself with your own rope. He was his, if he was in the courtroom, he would have been his worst witness was himself. Why? Because if he was so afraid of the man and knew how much the man was going to hold him accountable, it should have motivated him even more. So he said, you've already judged yourself with your own words. If you were so frightened of what I would have done, you should have done so. And listen to this. He's saying, look, at least you could have went down to Jerusalem National Bank and put in a CD, a money market, or just even a little savings account. And and experts do say, not that there was a Jerusalem National Bank, but experts do say, historians say, that the banking system back then, it was about 6%. you at least safely, you could have took my one minor, drove down to Jerusalem National Bank, opened a a savings account, gave them my minor, and at least when I came back, I would at least had 6% with a no-brainer. And you wouldn't even do that. You wouldn't even do that. I'm back here and you're giving me back only what I gave you. That wasn't what I wanted to. I wanted to give you all that I gave you so that you would invest it in other people. And that would have been something. In other words, what he was saying was nobody has an excuse. Everybody can do something, is what he said. That's Strickland's summary. Everybody can do something. But he didn't. He didn't do anything. A lot of people are waiting. When I retire, when I get out of school, when things settle down, when the kids get out, when this happens, this happens. Yes, we have a lot of commitments, but we need to be investing in some way all the time. Even Psalm says, do not the wicked renounce God? Why do wicked people renounce God? Because he says in his heart, you will not require an account. Nobody's going to hold me accountable is what the wicked said, but sometimes even... Save people think that. There will be no account. According to this, there is. And then we wrap up with this one. He expects us to know there will be consequences. Then he said to the bystanders, take away from him, the mina, away from him, and give it to the one who has 10 minus. Now, if you didn't think there were Baptists back in Bible day, listen to what this says. Then they said to him, but master, he already has 10 minus. <laughs> That's no fair. Where's the fairness in that? Well, let me ask you to see where the fairness is in that. Let's put you in the scenario of the master. If you were preparing for retirement, okay, and you had investments in this company, this company, and this company, and you're 10 years from retirement, and you go and you say, hey guys, how are y'all doing with my money? Thousand percent return. How are you guys doing with my money for retirement? We're giving you 500%. Good, good. Hey guys, how are you doing with my money? Oh, we're right now at zero. Now, let me tell you what every one of you guys would do, including me. I'd say, excuse me, we're taking your money, my money away from you 
and we're going to give it to this guy over here. Amen. Who in here wouldn't do that? And Now, you wouldn't do it. And you say, no, I couldn't do that. That wouldn't be fair to this guy. Poor guy. He's probably not making much money. Let me leave my money there. No, you said it's not about fairness. It's about my retirement. You're getting the guy that's doing the most with it. And how much do we lose? This principle, I believe, is for, for the millennial reign of how we'll reign with Christ and it's gonna make a big deal. A lot of people just say, just Brother Tim, as long as I'm in heaven, that's all that's gonna matter. Yes, heaven's gonna be a big deal, but do not know that Jesus is not gonna expect this. It will make a difference. It will make a difference in all of eternity and I believe this principle goes into life here, in my opinion. You can see that principle in Luke 8 about people who didn't want to do what God said, listeners, and he said, from that which is taken away shall be given. In other words, I believe maybe we're losing part of what we have in this life and our time, talent, and treasure because we're not using it for his kingdom. I believe that principle maybe could apply even to life today. It, don't your companies tell you that with your uh, vacation days? They have a saying most companies do, use it or lose it. I wonder if that's true with our kingdom stuff. I wonder if that's why I'm losing time, losing money, you're losing talent, losing this. I wonder where it's all going. I wonder if the same thing is true. What's true? Verse 26, I tell you that everyone who has, more shall be given. But the one who does not have, even what he does have, shall be taken away. What if that principle even works today? He's taking it away. He's taking it away. And then the ones who are getting it all are the ones who've given it all. The ones who's making the most investments, the ones who've given the most and applying this principle to all those around him. March the 10th, 1995 was a big day for me. Back in January of 95, the church had asked me to quit my high school assistant principal position and come on full time at the church. After praying about it and some doubts and even when they came, they said several people didn't know that I would even accept it. And uh, after Hearing from the Lord, I said yes, and then I couldn't get out of my contract till March. And then on that day, that March 10th day, the school had said, you know, it was my last day, and so uh, Rebecca came with me that day, and Rachel, Hannah hadn't been born yet. And so we had a big get together, and all the teachers and counselors, and one of the superintendents was there, and. And not, I'm not saying anything good about myself. They said some things, some good things, probably more than they should. And then when we got through with that, I went back to my office to grab some things and went to go sit down and my chair wasn't there. And I said, some them little rascals, they couldn't even wait a whole day to take my chair. Somebody wanted my chair instead of their chair. I said, rascal, where's my chair? Oh, such and such, somebody wanted it. And they couldn't wait till I was gone. Oh, that's, that's, that's cold. So then um, somebody said, oh yeah, by the way, such and I can't remember who it was, wants to see you in the high school in the auditorium. So Rebecca and I and Rachel went toward the auditorium to see this person. And we opened the door. There were all the students who had been assembled without my knowledge which that's not supposed to happen when you're a sister principal. It's not supposed to do that. I guess they say, you're already fired. You're already out here. And uh, there was my chair on the, what do you call that? Stage for me to sit down up there. And it's a chair for Rachel and Rebecca on each side, like it was a throne kind of thing. And they did little skits, you know, trying to mock, some of my funny just, you know, and they had a little walkie-talkie, you know, and they had an old coat that they thought wasn't in style that I thought was pretty cool. It was an old leather jacket. <laughs> it was an old leather jacket. I thought it was cool. And what were they wearing? I wonder why Rebecca 
He said, where's your leather jacket? And of course, they're wearing the leather jacket, you know, because I'd go down the hallway and, you know, and they did some little skip things, you know, that made fun and said some things. You know, I had questioned, you know, was in my spirit, I knew I was making the right decision, but you know how we do the what ifs and logically, am I making the right deal? And on paper and with computer, I didn't, this brain said, you're making, you're, a, you're getting a PhD doing stupidness. And my spirit was saying, you're making the very best decision you ever made. And God used this. And I believe he'll use a situation in your life to say, you know what? Did I make an influence? And that it, will this be kind of a little glimpse of heaven? Maybe that song is right that says, the song I can only imagine. Maybe that is how it'll be. That people will be coming up to us and saying, thank you for teaching my lift group. That's where I learned so much. Thank you for bringing me that food when I was hungry. Thank you for visiting me in the hospital when I felt so bad. Thank you at church when you said those words to me that encouraged me to, when I was at my last leg and you gave me a word. Thank you for that day you came up to me in church and say, can I pray for you? I know you're going through a, a difficult time. You know, thank you for that day you came up to me and you said, here's a book I think will help you. Thank you that you were in lift group that day as one of our lift group members and you took me aside and said, here's a word I think will help you during this difficult situation. Thank you for that time when I was in the hospital and you brought me food or you brought food to my family and, and helped me during this situation. Thank you in Sunday school that you brought the gospel to me and I heard it for the first time and I'm here. Thank you for how you gave to this mission trip. Thank you how you gave to this. Because of that, I'm here. Thank you because you did this and I grew up to be a Christian and I went to full-time service. Thank you because you did this and I learned the Bible in order to teach Sunday school better and on and on and on and on it goes. What they're saying is thank you for your investment. Thank you that you used your mana for something eternal that changed my life. Give him the glory. They're going to be coming up, I believe, left and right for mana investment. You took your life potential and you used it for the glory of God. And when Jesus comes, are you seeing face to face in death? He's going to say, let's look at what you did with that mind. And you say, let's roll the tape. Woo, I want to sit back and watch. Or somebody's going to say, do you got a blindfold? Because I don't want to watch this. This is going to be short. Now, it won't be anything for our glory. It'll be all crowns that I can say, thank you, Jesus. I couldn't have done any of that without you. None of it. I don't take credit. You don't take credit for any of it. We only have what we have. If we use what we use, God, you used the donkey. That gave me confidence God could use me because I'm right up there. I'm not any higher than that, but at least right I'm at donkey level. And if God could use a donkey, God can use me and God can use you because it's just our life potential. That's what he expects. And when he comes back, that's what he's going to expect. And there's no elevation. Whether you're the one giving the message or you're the one singing or you're the one watching the nursery so that somebody can come in here to listen, it's all equal ground at the cross. There is no elevation. You've heard us say that before. A lot of churches, and I'm not judging them, have these chairs up on this altar that look like thrones. And I'm not judging them, but to me, they look like thrones. We always agree that whatever chair would be out there would be up here because there is no difference in anybody sitting up here than sitting down there. It is all equal ground. It's all of us just saying, we all got the same amount. We all have one mina and we're all to use it to invest in however the Lord leads us in our gifts and our talents and our time. I said, Brother Tim, I've lost some time. We've all. But there's nothing I can do and you can do about time behind us. That's already done, buried and gone. No use doing anything, weeping or crying or belly aching or complaining or doubting or I wonder what I could have, should have, would have done. That's behind me now. But in front of me, from this day forward, I can say, I'm going to make some investments. When he comes back, I know what he's going to expect and I'm going to show him something. Not to brag, it's all for him, but I'm going to do some investing for his glory. That's why another parable that was similar to this called the talents ended up by saying, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Let's stand to our feet as our music team comes.